Alexander Arnold. It's running! From doubter to believer. Hey everyone, welcome to the LFC Couch. My name is Nish, your host. I'm so excited. It's been a long time since we've done a special, and it feels special to be doing a special. And so I'm joined by the one and only Mr. Chris Williams. How are you, sir? I'm very well, thank you. Thanks for having me on. And uh, yeah, good morning to you. Good, good evening to me as we've chatted. But yeah, it's great to be on. It's amazing. So it's uh, it's 8 a.m. here in Sydney, and it is 11 p.m. where you are? It- yeah, 11 p.m. Wednesday. So yeah, I'm talking to the future, which is great. Yeah, uh, don't buy stocks in Apple. It yeah, things go bad overnight. <laughs> Quick pro tip. Uh, awesome to have you here, man. It, it's it's so good. We've been talking on Twitter a little bit in the background, and just uh, we have kind of like similar views on things that that go on on the Twitter sphere. And so it's good to have you on, especially during these crazy, crazy times of COVID exploding and stuff. But um, before we dive into the things that are happening now, people are probably sitting there with certain names that they probably want us to talk about. But before we get into that, I always like to get a bit of an introduction so those who don't know you, uh, who you are, what you do, and especially how did you get involved with Liverpool Football Club? And I'd like to know about the Bundesliga too. Yeah, sure. So hello. Uh, Yeah, I'm Chris Williams. So I am now um a a football journalist have been um professionally for the last five years before that i suppose you could just call me um a blogger so i I blogged in my spare time went to the match came home talked about it um i mean way way back in the late 90s i was a freelance music journalist had a lot more hair was a lot cooler looking than i am now um and sorry what uh, were there what what genre of music were you uh, doing um so it was it was it was the mid to late 90s so it was very much i think you call it brit pop now but indie so it wasn't just the likes of um oasis to blur there was bands like shed seven and echo belly and and probably bands that people are like who is he going on about but um <laughs> yeah and that i mean that was way back really where if if the internet wasn't a big thing so if you weren't working at a paper you didn't really have a job so i shelved it um joined the air force royal air force in the uk um, was in for 17 years in total and Jesus. wanted to get out and get back into writing. So, yeah, that's what I did. And five years later, here I am, um, FIFA, UEFA accredited, go to Champions League matches, um, born and bred in Liverpool um, originally, accents well gone by now, comes <laughs> back occasionally because uh, I've lived all over, the, all over the world in certain places. But, um, yeah, that's so Liverpool born and bred. That's how I got involved with Liverpool. Didn't have a choice. That's, you know, my dad's and my granddad's upbringing. Yeah. Um, and yeah, when I returned to journalism or when I was blogging anyway, this is early 2000s, mm-hmm. um, I was obviously going to the match and, and covering Liverpool. And yeah, it went on from there. But I mean, as you'll know, the Premier League is a very saturated marketplace. So um, years and years ago, um, when Sky first came out, there was Sky Sports, Sky News, Sky One, I think. That was it. And it used to share a satellite with um, Italian television, German television, French television. And there used to be a time called DSF, Deutsche Sport, Funk, I think it was. And they used to show live Premier League games so I could watch, uh, sorry, live Bundesliga games so I could watch Bundesliga easier than I could watch Premier League football. Ah, that makes a lot more sense. <laughs> so I was like going... Do you have any German background? Do you, do, you, do you speak German fluently now? What's what's the go? My Deutsch is not that good. In Schaldergung, my Deutsch is not that good. I can get by in, um, I can go to a restaurant and order food. Gotcha. Um, the problem is everybody over the age of like 20, between the brackets of 20 and 60 speaks fluent English. Um, yeah. And they don't really get that chance to practice it. So whenever I go over and I've got a terrible German accent and I don't speak enough German, um, they go, are you English? Yes. And then they want to practice their English. So it's a bit of a, a lose-lose. My written, geschrieben's klar, and gesprochen nicht so good. So, yeah. All right. Because um, a lot of Germans speak English quite fluently, don't they? They learn it early in school. Yeah, yeah, they do. They um, learn it a lot differently than certainly I learned languages and what my kids learned languages in the UK. They, um, they, learn, they learn applicable English and then they learn sentence formation after. And, uh, yeah, pretty much... He does say that 20 to 60 year old is is fluent to certain parts if you go to the old east yeah. um like i've been to leipzig dresden a lot less people speak english but i'm pretty sure they're more fluent in russian right. um but um but yeah they they try and, and if you try you can get by in pretty much jenglish these days it's a bit of a mixture of both but um yeah certainly if i go to berlin 
um, English is, is pretty well spoken and places like North Rhine Westphalen, so Dortmund, Cologne, Leverkusen, um, especially where old um, American and, and UK um, bases were um, when Germany, you know, after the war, um, they all speak fluent English and, and have done anyway. So yeah, it's, um, it can be a pain sometimes because I am desperately trying to improve my German, but when everybody speaks English, it can be a bit of a nightmare. No, I can totally understand. Um, you did touch on the Royal Air Force there. Really interested to just quickly, what was your main role there? That would be, that's quite an interesting thing to, to go yeah, to. Yeah, so, um, so I joined as an assistant air traffic controller. So I used to um, basically look after vehicles and, and taxiing aircraft at certain bases. Um, there was a controllers that looked after the planes in the sky, uh, worked at Heathrow Radar Center for a bit, um, looking after military aircraft crossing into um, civilian airspace. Um, worked on a Harrier squadron for four years. That was superb. Um, and then I um, took a commission. So I changed from a non-commission to a commissioned officer and um, did physical education, looked after people's physical education needs. Um, and then, yeah, left after well, 17, 18 years in total. That's pretty incredible. Good thing is that now you're looking after, you know, you, you see a lot of transfers happen. You'll be pretty amazing at the uh, the flight tracker <laughs> when it comes. And <laughs> yeah. In fact, I, I did a story on... Jaden Sancho flying back and, and someone was like, how do you know that? And I thought, well, I'm not going to go into great details. I just said, I know it. It just, <laughs> just saved me about 20 minutes worth of conversation. You dialed into the pilot. <laughs> just, oh, oh, give us your Free name. apps. It's plenty of free apps. Yeah, I can imagine. Oh, that's great. Okay, cool. So um, I, I'm interested as well about the accreditations as well. So you essentially have to get your badges. Uh, so in that process, and this is for people out there, you know, the world has changed dramatically, uh, and I'm sure a lot of people are there going, now's maybe a great time to learn something new and maybe follow a, a passion that you've always wanted. Uh, and so one of them could be setting yourself up to be a full-time sports journalist uh, going forward. So those accreditations, A, how do you get them? And B, how does it help you as well in your field of work? Yeah, so I mean, it's, it's a great question. And loads of people ask, how do you get into a press box? It all depends on what league you cover. So I'm a member of APES, which is the International Sports Press Association. That gives me um, an International Sports Press Association card. Um, it also gives me a UK version. So um, if you wanted to do it, you'd apply to your national um, journalist, sports journalists um, society, which is obviously be the Australian one. And then you get the international card. So I'm a member of sports journalist um the United Kingdom, and that gives me access to the Apes card, the international card. So those two cards themselves will get me into any UEFA Europa League game, Champions League game, uh, Liga, Serie A, Bundesliga, and pretty much all over Europe um, and the world. Uh, I know colleagues of mine work in uh, MLS. They just use the same card that I've got, um, and it gets them in. Um, UK is a bit more tricky, um, especially England, because it's uh, run by a company called Dataco. Um, on behalf of the Premier League and the Football League. And um, they're very, very strict. Uh, you need to be a, a massive outlet. So my um, anything I do Premier League is mostly remote at the moment. Um, this is why you can find me on a Saturday in a Bundesliga ground because I've got the right credentials to get into that. Um, Premier League is, um, if I say a little bit more of a closed shop, that would probably be a little unfair, but it wouldn't be too far away from the truth either. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, I'm sure a lot of us have also gone and seen a lot of press conferences. I love watching press conferences. I don't know why. I'm one of those freaks who wants to watch every pre, every post, and hear every question that goes on. And there's some questions that get asked. And you're like, how does that person get into that room to ask that idiotic question? And then you find out they're from some like random podcast like me. <laughs> they're going, and then you're going, how did that person get into that room? So... Do they usually have better restrictions? To hear that the Premier League's a lot tighter um, actually surprises me because I, I do know there's some people who just like found their way in, but I'm sure there's always some back doors into these rooms. So that, that is for your match day, your match day accreditation. So uh, match day minus one, as it's called, which is where you know, you'll know you see uh, managers and, and players speak to the press. You can, um, as long as you've got a, a journalist card, you, you can get in as long as you give that club a heads up. Um, so it's not as strict to get into the press conference pre-match. Um, obviously, post-match is because you need to have the right accreditation to get into the match itself. Um, but yeah, the European games are normally where you'll get some crazy questions because UEFA have got pretty much an open-door policy. So if there's room in there, the clubs are, are duty-bound to um, offer the space, which is why you'll see on a uh, Champions League night at Anfield, 
probably twice as many journalists as you would get for a Premier League game. Makes a lot more sense. Thank you very much. <laughs> and I'm sure you and your fellow uh, you know, professional journalism fraternity do face palm yourselves a few times <laughs> it has it ever been you don't need to name any specifics has there been any time where you've heard a question and you remember that question in the back of your mind you go how could you and why would you <laughs> yeah so i think it might have been after it, in fact it was after um the atletico madrid game at anfield where liverpool went out um and someone um, asked Jurgen Klopp a question, did he sing Andrew Robertson happy birthday? Which is probably not the sort of question you want to ask a manager after he's exited the Champions League, but someone thought it was appropriate. Um, yeah, they got a very short answer. It's probably, let, let's put it that way. <laughs> Klopp must be a breath of fresh air, to say the least. I'm sure you've seen plenty of managers go through. Oh, I've got a lot of noise in the background. Apologies for that. Uh, no I've seen a lot of Liverpool managers come and go along the time, some with massive amounts of charisma, some with less but Klopp in particular, uh, you've obviously had chances to ask him questions. You've heard a lot of his answers and stuff. What is it that strikes you most about him when you hear him talk and the things he says? So, well, first of all, he's a dream to answer questions to you. Um, ask him an open question and he will just go on as, as long as he can possibly think of something to say. So he is a joy to speak to. Um, unless you catch him in the wrong mood. And then, yeah, there's, there's times where I certainly have shied away from asking a question um, and there's times where I've asked questions and got a great answer. I spoke to him directly after Liverpool beat um, Bayern Munich in the Allianz Arena, um, asked him uh, just a couple of questions, and, and he went on um, probably for about two or three minutes, which is quite a long time um, to spend on one person. Um, but I've seen people ask questions after a defeat and you know get 30 seconds max. Um, yeah, he's a great guy to talk to. Um, but by the time he gets to us, sat down, he's generally calmed down a bit. Um, sometimes I feel a little sorry for the rights holders on television who get them straight after the match. You, I mean, Jeff Sharif's got a bit of a short shrift not too long ago. Um, <laughs> but they, they, they tend to, all managers and players tend to calm down once they get to the written press area and they're maybe a little bit more reserved. Some of them are. <laughs> to say the least some are not so much so but uh, Klopp is definitely something quite special to the club oh, it's great to see um, okay let's move on to the year that's just gone you and I, I'm always more fascinated I mean we have fans like myself we follow the club all our life and we have all these wild emotions about the the game that's just passed and the season that's just passed and the the titles we've won of recent and we have that joy and elation but then there's people like yourself who dedicate themselves to the sport who go to the game not only just to enjoy themselves but also to work so you can't just get all you know drunk and pissed up for the game and then enjoy yourself I'm with your mates afterwards yeah damn well <laughs> not as often <laughs> so for you then you have dedicated yourself to the sport it's your career it's your it's it's your your money maker as well because you 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 have to feed your family of course what does that win that season mean to you personally yeah i mean this season was just the weirdest one because of the break i think before football finished it was probably well, football took a break it was probably the best you know season i've ever had reporting um because I was, my time was split. Well, my time is split between covering the Bundesliga and then when Klopp came to Liverpool, that because I covered German football, I was assigned Jurgen Klopp at Liverpool, which is obviously a dream for me for one of the websites to write for and I've written for for the last couple of years. So to follow that journey um, as a fan and also working has been tremendous. But I think once football stopped, there was, I don't want to say anti-climax, um, but there was something very different and I just wanted to see Liverpool win that title that, you know, you'd waited to see, I'd waited to see every Liverpool supporter waited to see. But prior to that, um, yeah, it was, it was a roller coaster ride. I mean, I remember I covered Bayern Munich were playing against Hertha Berlin in Berlin. Um, and I watched the last 10 minutes of the Liverpool Manchester United game on the S bahn on the way back to the airport. Obviously I had it on my phone, um, Salah goes through, scores that wonderful goal. I react like you would react or like anybody else would react when watching. And I'm on a packed um, train full of um, Bayern Munich and Hertha Berlin fans. So that that's uh, that's great. That that I mean that that's great for me. Obviously, when I'm in the press box at Anfield, I, I can't be like that um, because I've got a job to do. 
I mean, the only time that a, a little bit of decorum went was um, when um, when Divock Carigi scored that fourth against Oof. Barcelona. Then I, I wasn't the only one, and I think pretty much half the press box were on the feet that night. Um, but but yeah, normally it, it's just working, 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 and I suppose I, I found it quite cathartic because. You know, when you're a, when you're there purely as a fan, it is quite frustrating because you know your only outlet is through your mouth. So some people shout, some people boo, some people whistle, some people shout, "Come on!" I've actually got a medium in front of me to to either express those feelings that I've got. And if I'm on a match report, that match report has to be out around about five minutes after the full time whistle. So it's constantly being written and changed. And you know, if, if if a player does something that annoys me, I can write that down and then delete it and start again. And, and that normally helps me get through that. But um, yeah, it, it's, I wouldn't say it's spoiled football um, because it hasn't, I just watch it a lot differently now, but previous to that, when I was in the air force, I was a, I was a coach. I'm, I'm a qualified coach um, and I'm also a qualified referee. So football sort of been tainted in the past for me now anyway, but yeah, I do watch it differently. Um, it would be nice, or well, it has been nice actually, to watch the Champions League um, finals in in Lisbon because I had no no horse in that race, so I was able to just watch it neutrally and freely. So that was a bit of a breath of fresh air. Obviously, I'd like to see Liverpool in it again, but sometimes it's nice to let other people win. Yeah, exactly. Sometimes we'll let a couple of others in, in the Champions League, not the Premier League anymore, unfortunately. So uh, it's good to see. Now, it makes complete sense. I, I've heard a lot of that from musicians, especially. You know, as soon as you start studying music, you uh, you can't listen to it ever again the same way. And you, you sometimes you stop liking it as much, but you start appreciating it more, especially mm. even the really simple, even the stuff that you don't even enjoy. You go, ah, I know what you've done there, and it's actually quite genius. <laughs> so it's, uh, it makes complete sense. And, you know, one day when you've retired and you sit down, then you can you can sit there and just enjoy with a pint <laughs> and watch the game that way. Um, Maybe. You did mention something that poked up my ears a bit, though. You mentioned how the match day report has to go out five minutes after the full-time whistle. Uh, does it Does it frustrate you, or do you like the benefit of the people need information as quickly as possible it's a get it out as quickly as possible sort of scenario versus before when you probably could have taken your time and released a report and stick it in a newspaper for the weekend or something like that how's it changed for you as well yeah i mean it, it's um, it's a pressure but it's a healthy pressure i think it, you know it keeps you on your toes it's an art form that you've got to learn um and then lots of things fall out of it. So there'll be copy that I, I, I don't use in, in my final report that I will use, for instance, later on. So I don't just do the match report on a typical match day. I've got maybe a pre-match piece to do, then I'll have a match report, and then I'll have a post-match report to do. So which is why you'll see people not leaving grounds till midnight because there's, you know, it's just not that one piece of work. There's three or four things that you need to get done or three or four bits of content that your editors might want to get out. So um it's challenging, but it's a good challenge. And you know, it, it certainly there's never a dull 90 minutes. I don't think I've ever sat through any football match, be it a Liverpool match or a Bundesliga match or a Europa League match, a Champions League match, where I've thought this is dragging a bit because you know, you've always got an eye on the time. I mean, the, the worst thing you can get, I had it once in Germany, was a nil-nil um, with four minutes to go and, and then it ends 2-2. That, that, that can be a bit of a challenge because the... Um, the timeline doesn't slip, unfortunately. The deadline's still the same. Um, but yeah, you go through. I, I tend to um, draft mine um, first half and then I sit in my seat for half time, write the first bit, um, and then I'm, I'm going through. So man of the match, you can start to get a feel for that after about 25 minutes, unless it's a you know really dull game. You can tend to feel who's going to get that man of the match and maybe moments of the match as well. So uh, a chance that was well saved or a sitter that was missed or really good piece of play you can like graph that in as well so um i mean these days um and especially for the last champions league campaign i'd pretty much done you know one or two minutes before full time and then in essence you're praying that no one else scores which is quite strange actually because you know <laughs> if liverpool are winning one nil i'm a liverpool fan at the end of the day but if i'm covering them you know and they're winning one nil and there's two minutes to go that's great i'm done yeah. They score another goal as a fan, that's brilliant, but it, it, it resets my work a little bit. So, um, yeah, it swings and roundabouts, but it's good fun, and I'd, I'd certainly never complain about it one bit. I can imagine. I can imagine, like, you've, you've, you've written out 600 words or 1,000 words or something, and then something happens at the end of the game where, you know, 
PSG scored two goals at the end to, to beat, I can't remember who it was they beat, but I really wanted them to win um, at, in the Atalanta. last... Yes, Atalanta. And then he scored two at the end. I'm like, oh, imagine you at the end where you've written all this praise about Atlanta and the amazing things that they've done. And then you have to like go command A and delete <laughs> at the end. Start again. Uh, it, it's not too bad because obviously people people want to read the snapshot at the beginning. So your first paragraph is pretty much a summary. So for instance, Kingsley Coburn scored a wonderful goal to win Bayern Munich, their sixth Champions League. That would be your intro. And then there's the bits that happened in the game. And then the end bit would be however you want to end it. So um, it's only the first and end paragraph that will probably change if if there was a major you know, impact in, in extra time or injury time, I should say, or if, you know, late on, a bit of late drama. So it, it can be a challenge. It's as I say, it's when it's nil-nil with five minutes to go or three minutes to go, and then it ends up 1-1, 2-2, or you know, three players get sent off and someone scores a penalty, then it gets a little bit tasty. But yeah, you know, there's people who work a lot harder than me who just have to throw three words on a page, so you just have to deal with it. Yeah, I'm very lazy in that sense. All I have to do, because I run a, a, a podcast, we've got lots of guys as well, we kind of all represent the same couch. Uh, I just write half-time thoughts, full-time thoughts. And People may think it's for them. It's not. It's only for me. <laughs> it's just so I can keep a track of, oh, they actually played really well in the first half, even though they sucked second half. And I'm not going to let my mind deceive me and think they had a crap all the way through. I'm yeah. going to, and it's happened so many times. I'm like, oh, wow, no, they were actually really good first half. And they made three mistakes in the second half, which lost us the game. But the first half, they were outstanding. So I'm going to talk about that. And that's that's all. And but I have to squeeze it into 240 characters, <laughs> so it makes it a little bit harder. But it's uh, my job's a lot easier. I talk. I can't write. I'm not a writer, so it'll never work that way. Um, do you mind if we tack onto Liverpool now and the things that are happening and all that good stuff? Awesome. Excellent. So how about we start with the uh, the potential outgoings? Because in preseason, we haven't seen some certain people. Uh, one certain striker that I nicknamed my son after, Lord Divock. We haven't seen him at all in preseason. I know Shakiri. I think he was injured again. I don't know. Um, do you foresee any further outgoings from this current squad? I mean, of course, but you should probably go head on into, you know, minutes before I came on, there's so many stories about Wijnaldum potentially leaving. Um, Ronald Koeman wants to sign him for Barcelona. I mean, that's the Dutch press are saying that. Um, so there's normally no smoke without fire. Um, I mean, I would be sad to see him go because I think he's a, he's a great player, but I think you have to look at it from his side. He's won the Premier League, he's won the Champions League. He's won the Club World Cup with Liverpool. I mean, he's pretty much done it all. And I think sometimes player, uh, fans think, oh, why does he want to go? Well, you know, Gini Wijnaldum is a lovely lad, but you know, he's from the Netherlands. He's got no tie to Liverpool. If it was me, I'd be like Steven Gerrard. I want to stay me, spend, spend my whole career there. But you know, players come in and, and you know, they don't really have any loyalty as such um, at the end of the day. And if a club like Barcelona would come in, maybe his, his head would be turned. But I mean, other People I can see potentially glowing. Marco Gruic, who I think is a great player, but the Liverpool he joined isn't the Liverpool now. It's a completely different club. I remember as a, I think it was one of his first games. We beat Barcelona 4 0 at Wembley. The header, played right? really <laughs> a fantastic header. Um, yeah, Liverpool is a completely different animal now. And I think he's a really good player, but I, I personally don't know if he's ready you know, for that challenge that Liverpool would have. And, he can certainly play week in, week out for um, a Bundesliga side, top six Bundesliga side, top 10 Bundesliga side, maybe even, um, you know, um, sixth to 15th Premier League side. He could start week in, week out. And is he going to be happy sitting on Liverpool's bench? You know, that's maybe one to discuss. But I would see fringe plays. I certainly can't see any you know, major outgoings as such. You know, Wijnaldum would be a, a pretty major outgoing. But there's been talk about Mane going and, and maybe Salah going and, yeah, it's just crazy stories this time of year that, you know, I think you take with a pinch of salt sometimes. A hundred percent. Two things. I'll, I'll speak about both Gruich and, and Wijnaldum. So with with Gruich especially, I think the thing that he just hasn't done enough is shoot. Because when I, you know, everyone does their YouTube scouting. <laughs> I don't exactly watch those. Is it Serbian League? I can't remember which league he came from. Uh, but was it yeah. Serbian? Yeah. Yeah. Belgrade, I think. Yes, Bel so he, uh, those, some of the shots he would take from distance were just deadly. They were just straight arrows, straight into the corners and stuff like that. And I was going, mate, 
<laughs> do a couple of those. You'll be a cop hero in no time. But he just never does it. So I think he was taught and trained to be a bit more careful, be a bit more, you know, precise in your decisions, but sometimes need a little bit of insanity in the midfield and a little bit of a crazy idea. Why not just give it a ping <laughs> and try? And yeah. I haven't seen, I don't think he did much of that for Berlin as well. I'm not, you can probably fill me in on that. Did, did he score many goals? Did he even try many shots from distance? Do you remember? I mean, he has scored a couple um, and he's had a couple of assists as well. But in the area that he's played for Berlin, he's not been exactly a defensive midfield. He's more of a central midfielder, certainly not attacking. So maybe the pass that leads to the assist or holding up a, a good good defensive shape or a good shape outside of the box. I mean, he has got himself in and involved in around the box. And yeah, I mean, he's done some crazy stuff. He pulled down Robert Lewandowski when Berlin were, were winning in the um, Allianz Arena gave away a penalty which he should never have done so he, he is um, prone to a little bit of craziness but I mean he's fitted in really well there and he's been tracked um, not just by Hertha Berlin but by by Lever, sorry uh, by um, Bruce Munch and Gladbach um, as well so I mean they've been keeping an eye on him um, and yeah he's as I say I think he's he's found his niche you know not everybody is going to be Lionel Messi not everybody is going to be you know the, the best player in the world some players will be equally at home playing for a mid-table team like you will get um, players who are fantastic playing in the championship. They never really make it in the Premier League, but that's not to say they're not good players. They've just got their level. And I think Marco Gruwich's level is is unfortunately not at Liverpool at the moment. That makes sense, yeah. I do remember, I think the Berlin manager or the CEO or someone came out and said he's the best midfielder we've had in like 20 years or something like that. So huge praise for the young man. And all you want is your players to be happy. I mean, Connor Cody is just a prime example of that. He was a defensive midfielder for us. He went off, he you know, went through a couple of, I think he was at Sheffield and Sheffield Wednesday, I think, for a period of time. Ends up at, at the current club he's at now, and now called up for England. You know, it's just a beautiful story as a central, you know, defensive mid, uh, as a centre back. So sometimes you just got to wish him well and and hope that they find their feet somewhere. So good, good news. Then on to Wijnaldum. You know, people are talking about a certain player who plays in Germany right now for Bayern Munich, and they're going, "Oh, we will get him to replace Genie." I'm like, I don't think he's actually a Genie player because Genie's, he's not a a stats player he's a guy who in my opinion is incredible at holding up the ball incredible at shielding incredible at when the team is attacking us to get the ball hold it and completely destroy the opposition's flow and then start a counter-attack it's really hard to make that shine in a statistical fa fashion you have to actually watch him play <laughs> and understand your role he plays uh, what are your thoughts on that side yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people get frustrated with Gio Ronaldo because they see how he plays for Holland, well, or sorry, the Netherlands. Um, I think he's asked to do a completely different job for the Netherlands than he is to do at Liverpool. And, you know, I've seen him play against Germany in Germany uh, and he was tremendous. And and Liverpool fans are like, why isn't he playing like that for Liverpool? Well, he's not asked to do that. He's asked to play further forward, almost like a false nine at times in that, you know, 10 role he can do that for um, like a second striker almost for the Dutch on occasion, or he's given that freedom to to go forward as an attacking midfielder. And he doesn't, not that he doesn't get that freedom at Liverpool, but his job within the Liverpool system isn't that, as you quite rightly said, it's to like, it's to break up play. It's to spot the lines in. He's not as creative for Liverpool because he's not asked to do that um, for Liverpool. And if he was, maybe he would be just as good as he is for the Netherlands. And, I'm sure if he is to go to Barcelona and, and join up with Ronald Koeman, he would be asked to play, you know, the Gini Wijnaldum that plays for the Netherlands, he would ask to be played for that. But, you know, some people think, oh, yeah, he's, Thiago would come in and he would be, you know, a replacement. He wouldn't. He would be a different type of player. Yeah. Um, it would probably actually end up giving someone like Naby Keita less game time if, if Thiago came in. Um, and obviously, I know Wijnaldum and Keita maybe fight for that role but that's one role in that central three the defensive midfielder I think we can all agree goes to Fabinho now Jordan Henderson's a Liverpool captain so that leaves one spare place in that three-man midfield um, and that is the likes of Keita and uh, Milner and you know fighting with um, Wijnaldum for them places so I don't think Thiago will come in and, and just be instantly in there he would just add a little bit more depth to Liverpool but I think Wijnaldum's one of those players 
that sort of splits the fan base a little like Jordan Henderson does. But you notice when Jordan Henderson's not there, what he offers you. And when he is there, people go, he doesn't do anything until he's not there. And you see exactly what you're missing. So I think it'd be pretty much the same with Gini Wijnaldum as well, that only when he's not there would you appreciate what he doesn't do. 100%. Or what he does that you just don't see. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it seems to be the fashion of uh, football watchers these days that if you're not doing 10 step overs and Ronaldo flicks and rainbow flicks and doing all kinds of things, then you don't get noticed by a certain uh, viewership. I'm not going to put you down. I'm not going to put people into categories, uh, but there are certain people who, who watch for entertainment. They'd, and mm. entertainment to them is seeing someone not make someone else or do a huge bunch of skill moves rather than someone who's grafting, who helps the team win the game. <laughs> It's a, it's a whole different level of appreciation there. So, uh, yeah, it, it's nuts on that side. But you did bring up a certain person's name. I, I kind of intimated. You said Tiago. Where do you think that's at then? Is it is it a done deal in your head? It's nothing. It's obviously not a done deal because Liverpool haven't announced it. But if you were putting a percentage on it with your best guesstimate, I'm not going to put your name against it. But if you were to guess... Or if you want some educated stuff, you want to do a, a, a complete special on this podcast. Where is it at at this point in time? Yeah, it's such an interesting question because um, I'm lucky enough to have a foot in, in, in you know, both camps. Obviously, if um, if we're not in lock, well, no, we're not in lockdown anymore. But if we're not in travel restrictions as such, I'm pretty much every weekend in Germany, um, and I live in a, I live in England. So um, I can see both sides of it. Now in Germany, it, the talk is it's done. Um, pretty much now if you you know when I come back to the UK um, you know people who speak to the club and I think sometimes journalists get um, not a bad rep but I know some journalists do get a bad rep but they get a hard time because you know oh well what are you being told well you can only report what you're being told so if there are journalists that are speaking to their sources at Liverpool speaking to the club itself and saying you know are we in negotiations with Thiago and they go no not at all then that's what they have to report. Now, I think sometimes when you're selling a player, like Bayern Munich are, you're a little bit more happy to talk about selling a player because you know maybe someone else might come in and you might get a bit of a bidding war. Um, and clubs don't normally like it when, if you all go by all accounts in Germany, Thiago has said that he wants to play for Liverpool, he wants to come to England, he wants to feature under Jurgen Klopp, and that's all he wants to do. Um, and that can be a bit of a pain for a selling club sometimes because it puts other clubs off because I think we saw it with um, Van Dijk, you know, tremendous defender. No one else was really interested because he pretty much put it on the line. He only wanted to play for Liverpool. So um, it becomes difficult. But in Germany, it's it's not a matter of, of, of if, it's when. Um, but in the UK, it's um, I, I've heard it described as fanciful to not happening unless someone's sold. Now, that might be happening. Um, right at this moment, and and if they, if that does happen, maybe it'll free up some funds, and and we will see someone like Tiago come in. But there's far too much um, smoke for it to be nothing in, in Germany. You know, it, it's there's there's so many reports from some really well connected people as well. There's yeah. some massive outlets, and I'm not just on about um, Christian Fouts, a fantastic reporter, really well connected at, at Bayern Munich. Um, works for two outlets, Build and Sport Build. People say, which is the bad build? I've, I've tried to tell people this window. They're the same. It's the same thing. One's a daily, one's a weekly. So they're, they're in essence the same company, Build and Sport Build. They're owned by Axel Springer. Sport Build is a magazine, comes out on a Wednesday, builds your daily paper. So they work for both. Um, they work for both publications. And, you know, he's a very well-connected journalist, but he's not the only one that's saying it. There was a throwaway comment in Der Spiegel, which is a really highbrow um, outlet. Yep. that um, Thiago is, is all but signed for Liverpool. And then you combat it with what you see in the UK. And and yeah, maybe I think Liverpool like to own a lot of information. And I think we see a lot of Premier League clubs do this because the Premier League drives a lot of web traffic. And web traffic, of course, um, brings in a lot of advertising. So if you control the narrative, then you can control all that advertising that goes with it. And I think that's why club media is so closed these days. If you go back 10, 15 years um, you know, clubs were quite happy in, the, in in England. Were quite happy to talk to journalists. I think now they like to own that information, um, and yeah, for obvious financial reasons. And yeah, leaves sometimes leaves people on the outside. But 
there's people, there's, there's fantastic journalists like Melissa Reddy, who did a piece for The Independent, who said that Liverpool were interested. I don't think you can turn a blind eye to that comment. But yeah, I mean, going purely by what's on in Germany it is a matter of when, not if. Um, and, and, and yeah, you have to obviously have to counter that with what's um, with, with what you hear from Liverpool. So I know that's probably not helping anybody <laughs> because I'm like almost stuck in the middle because I can hear from one side yeah. Um, that, yeah, it's, it, it's cracking on. But you speak to people who are far more well-connected in Liverpool than me and, and they're telling you, no, it's not happening. So, yeah, it's, as, as always, these things, the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. Yeah, and it's really hard to um, disseminate. Uh, all I have is internet. You know, all I have is Twitter and trying to work out what's lies and what's what's people trying to grow their account through falsities and stuff like that. And, you know, there was talk of Michael Edwards actually being in, in Munich as we speak, trying to get it done. I don't even know if it's real. It's always nice to think about, but and it could very well be true. Uh, but any word? Do you know if that's real? <laughs> I might as well ask you. I've certainly not spoken to anybody that I know, and I do know quite a few people in Munich. Um, I've certainly not said, oh, by the way, um, Michael Edwards is in town. But at the moment, of course, quite a lot of journalists are over in Stuttgart because Germany are, are in, into the national team break and they were training and uh, today at Stuttgart. So that's where a lot of the the, um, the press are at the minute. So, yeah, there's not that many left um, correspondence-wise. So I don't know if people know that. It's, it's generally the correspondents that are very well connected. So the people who deal with the club day in, day out, um, they're obviously now covering the national side. So so they're not back in, in Munich at the moment. No, that makes complete sense. Well, let's see. Oh, Tiago coming in. I guess we've already worked out our, our midfield three. <laughs> Fabinho, Henderson, Tiago. If it happens, uh, just... I guess a different level, a different pace of creativity. I, I've always loved um, Hendo's passing range. His vi his vision is just incredible. What he can see, you can see what Fabinho, what he does with those chip balls over the top, and his how he spreads it around, and he shoots, which is nice. I hope to see him do more. And then Thiago, who will do the same. His passing range, his ability to open up gaps which you don't even know are there. You'll see Salah do a run, and Ormani do a run, then stop and get frustrated, or. Milner do a run and get frustrated at Simicasso when he doesn't pass to him in training. Uh, so yeah. plenty of things that could happen there. But it it's a great position to be in as a club where you just need to have those one or two players. And it was the one thing that made me jealous about those Man United squads over the years where they were just bringing a Rio Ferdinand. And that's it. We're going to splash all of our money on a Rio Ferdinand. That's it. Maybe get a couple of, you know, potential players on the side but Rio is going to be that one guy and they will just lift the game even higher each time each year continue making the league the bread and butter which is what it was for us and what it hopefully will be again for us and hopefully each year we just get one of these marquee players and go from there uh, again people that, oh, sorry yes yeah. I think that's pretty much what we were all expecting as fans and hoping for. So um, Allison came in, um, obviously Van Dyke came in before that. You've got the front three, pretty much. You obviously got Henderson as well uh, in, in that midfield area. You've pretty much got a really good spine. Um, so there's no need to go out and spend a hundred million each year. But for me, there is, there is areas that need developing. And that's, I think, where a club like Liverpool needs to, to do that. For me personally, I think the front three are fantastic, but, they could do with a challenge. Timo Werner would have been, he would have been it for me. I've seen him plenty of times at Leipzig. I've spoke to him. He's a really nice guy as well. But I mean, keep an eye on him because I think he's going to do phenomenally well at Chelsea. But he would have been nice to have come in. That would have been that extra little option. Um, Thiago will give that plan B, but Naby Keita will give that plan B as well. Um, another forward would be nice. We've got cover at left back now. Um, it's just adding those one or two per season, like exactly what you just said, to keep the squad fresh. I don't think, you know, no one's expecting Liverpool to go out and spend 80, 90 million on a centre-back to partner. Van Dijk doesn't need it. And people go, what happens if he gets injured? Well, if he gets injured, it's unlucky. You can't have, you know, Cabali's not going to come in. Upper Bacano is not going to come in with the, with the presence of your ear in case Van Dijk gets injured because they'd never sign. Um, but you just need to add little bits of quality here and there to keep the squad fresh and you know I'm not the only one that said that I think there's there's plenty of, of people. people who cover Liverpool as writers have said Liverpool need a couple more now it, it, it's whether that happens I think for me personally as a fan it would be a shame for Liverpool to be in this position of, of you know, teetering on the edge of some sort of dominance and for some sort of backup players not to come in and, and help with that dominance um, 
you know, especially if Manchester City were, God forbid, to get Lionel Messi, I think everyone would be playing an uphill battle straight away. So, I mean, Chelsea are doing some wonderful business. Manchester United have signed a couple of players as well, although I think they're probably still a couple off um, getting back to any of the likes of where they were. But, yeah, I mean, the way Chelsea are throwing the money about is, um, is a worry for me because they're not just signing players, they're signing actual quality. Um, Kai Havertz is obviously due to be announced at some point in the next week or so. Um, yeah, they've had a tremendous um, transfer window, but they think they're very lucky because they were unable to sell. Sorry, they were unable to buy. They sold some players, had a lot of money, and they're in a situation to be able to spend that money now when others haven't got it. But it would be nice to see a couple more additions. But then the window's open this till the 5th of October. So, you know, we're just on what are we today? 2nd of September. So the, op- the window's still open. It, if, if we were having this conversation at, you know, half past 10 on the 4th of October, I think it'd be pretty downbeat, but there's still plenty of time left yet. Yeah, it's pretty exciting. Uh, I, I mean, I, I just don't know what the club's going to be like next season. I mean, in my head, I'm going, don't change much. <laughs> Keep it the same. We are already a 20, 18 to 20 point better than any other club. club. Uh, but, you know, we saw Jamie Carragher, Gary Neville have a chat about the freshness and how that's needed each year. We've seen James Pierce and all these people all bring it up. And it's, it's completely right. In, in any business, uh, I work in software. I manage a team of people. I've just promoted a guy into my team and everyone's just like, wow, okay, cool. Let's help him out. Let's get him up. Let's get him up to speed quickly because we really want them to be successful. I'm sure that's exactly the same as what it's like um, in any football club as well, especially professionals. So, uh Let's see. I mean, we could talk transfers forever and ever and ever. I'm sure people want us to, but we've got a bunch of questions from the fans online. So do you mind if we go through those? Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, let's do that. Cool. Yussi from the couch, uh, our resident Finn. He says, who's the next upcoming superstar in Bundesliga who's under the radar, i.e. a Jürgen kind of transfer? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, there isn't that many at the moment because the Bundesliga is such a good league that anybody who starts to do remotely well gets noticed straight away. So, I mean, there's been players linked already. So Mila Rashika at Werder Bremen is, is a great player. Um, and I, he's one I would have liked to have seen at Liverpool, actually. Um, if you can't get Timo Werner, he would have been second best. He's, he can play on that left-hand side. He can play more centrally. Um, he can play behind a, a front one if he wanted. Let's say, for instance... Jurgen Klopp wanted to go to 4 2 3 1. He could operate in that system on the left or central, or he could play as a striker. Um, other players to keep an eye on. You, you probably have heard of most of them now, but like um, Baumgartling is a great player. Um, Julian Brandt, of course, at Dortmund. Jude Bellingham will be really good. Dortmund don't sign duds normally, um, especially when they get them from abroad. Um, of course, Jaden Sancho, Kai Havertz, Timo Werner. These are all guys that are leaving. But um, Rashika, I think, is probably one who could make the step to Liverpool. Um, the rest would need quite a lot of coaching, but they're a joy for me to watch at that level. Um, I just don't think if I was Jurgen Klopp, I'd be going and plundering the Bundesliga because the players that we could have gone and plundered are uh, pretty much been snapped up now or tied down on long-term contracts. Yeah, it makes sense. And <clears throat> the last thing we need is Liverpool to start splashing our money about in a un unsustainable way <laughs> so we don't get close to administration again that'd be nice <laughs> please um okay next one's from jimmy jimmy nicholson uh, in melbourne australia who's also part of the couch he goes chelsea have brought in you've mentioned chelsea before they've brought in some fantastic talent to add to their squad which is which already has some top players who have stepped up last season is lfc's quiet transfer window a sign we are already where chelsea want to be or are we in danger of falling behind if we don't bolster the squad yeah, it's another great question. So I think Liverpool are the team that everybody wants to be at the moment and everybody wants to beat. They want that high intensity of play. Um, Chelsea have certainly addressed that with some of the players they brought in. Ziyech, Werner, um, they're going to bring in Havertz, so we might as well lump him in there. And they're, they're going to take Chelsea to that next level to try and, and compete with Liverpool on, not just in a game against them, but consistently. You know, I think... Chelsea ran us very close in that game at Anfield um, and they have done that when we played them and, and we just edged them out occasionally apart from the cup games but it's doing it you know 38 times a week uh, sorry 38 times a season you need to be able to do it and Chelsea are signing players to to get them onto that um, personally I still think they need a goalkeeper 
um, and probably one more central defender. Um, and then they would be somewhere near Liverpool's level and, and that would be maybe a bit of a threat. Um, so, yeah, I think they are trying to get to the level Liverpool are. They want to break into, I think, that that top three or top two, especially. They want to be challenging Manchester City and Liverpool for the title. Um, they've certainly spent well enough. There'll be no excuses, I think, for Frank Lampard to not to be able to deliver that in the future. Um, are we in danger of falling behind? Um, this time last year, I would have said no, because I think Liverpool had, had done everything well. They'd learned from that defeat in Kiev. They'd gone on and won it in Madrid. And there was just that feeling that actually the Premier League is now within touching distance. And of course, he we went and had that tremendous season. I think the shine has been taken off it by the closed the games that came back behind the closed doors. Liverpool, in essence, needed three points to win the title and they got that against Crystal Palace. Manchester City gifted him it after that. Um, so the intensity is not going to be there. But prior to that, Liverpool's football was electric. Um, um, as I've said previously, I think we could do with um, uh, one or two coming in to just keep that freshness within the club. Um, I'd hate for us to be talking in a year's time and be, you know, we just missed out on the Champions League and we just missed out on the league. But, you know, we won the FA Cup and we haven't won that before. It would be great. Or we haven't won that for a while. Certainly haven't won it under Jurgen Klopp. That would be, you know, a great thing to do. Um, I, I would hate for us to just miss out on some, you know, the bigger trophies because we didn't have that little extra depth or we didn't have that plan B. We didn't have that traditional number nine that could come on and, 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 and change a game. Or we didn't have that extra little lock picker in the midfield to be able to unpick you know, defences when it wasn't looking particularly good. Maybe they're too deep and maybe we're trying to, you know, just, I know we don't just fire crosses in, but we're trying to get behind those deep lines. And if we don't bring a player in that can just unpick that lock, I think it'd be quite a, a sad thing for Liverpool to do, because as I said previously, I think we're teetering on the edge of, you know, maybe doing a Manchester City where, you know, you're winning back-to-back -back titles and looking like you can win three on a bounce or four on a bounce and doing well in Europe and having the squad to win every domestic trophy in England and still challenging the Champions League. I'd hate for that not to happen to Liverpool because they didn't spend, and it's going to sound crazy, they didn't spend maybe 40 or 50 million pounds um, over five, you know, and spread that over the cost of a contract over five years. Um, but, I, you know, if I had 50 million pounds, I'd, I'd give it to Liverpool to, to buy a forward, but I don't. So I'm in no place to tell anybody where to spend their 50 million pounds. <laughs> I've got a few ideas what I could do with fifty million pounds. <laughs> I'm not sure if I would spend it on one player, but it's a it'll be an interesting prospect to do. And I think people forget that that it's fifty million pounds. <laughs> it's like, guys, you're not just throwing pocket money out the window, even to a Liverpool football club that could be valued at billions of pounds. Uh, doesn't mean they just have billions of pounds to throw away. Value is very different to actually having it on hand and then recognizing that we're in very difficult times and sometimes you just need to do what you can and get through certain years and make it better. It's not what people want to hear, but I care more about the club and the sustainability and it's going to stay there. And the one of the worst days of my football supporting life was hearing that we could be going into administration and that fear stays in my head every single day. And I will support any decision that keeps us as far away from that as possible. So that's, that's kind of how my head works anyway. Yeah, the, only, the only thing I would say on that, Nish, is that um, obviously covering German football, I, I have seen this before to some extent. So um, Jürgen Klopp broke the dominance of Bayern Munich, um, did it very well, won back-to-back -back Bundesliga titles. They didn't strengthen after that second season. Yeah. Um, they just missed out on the league to Bayern. They got beaten in a Champions League final by Bayern um, and no other club has won the league title since, apart from Bayern. And they went into the season after that. It was a terrible season. Um, obviously Klopp left after that and, and that club has never been the same again. So that is the only thing that frightens me Stays um, <laughs> with this situation is that I, I've seen it before and you know, Jurgen Klopp is a superb coach, but he's not a magician and that's what Dortmund are asking him to be and I'd hope Liverpool don't ask him to be a magician because he's not one. Yeah. And you think someone like Klopp, I mean, people forget that Klopp also develops, you know, a manager develops, a team develops. I'm sure they learn from those sort of mistakes. You know, we've lost Lewandowski. We've just lost him off to, to Bayern Munich. Let's probably use that money, reinvest. And I think that was the thinking around Coutinho. Okay, we've lost our best player at the time. 
140 million. We need to invest properly, otherwise we will fall deep into obscurity. And we went the complete opposite. <laughs> so I'm praying that the people up the top also recognize that that's the, the process. If we do lose someone, invest it straight away. Don't wait. So let's see. Um, got a couple more questions. Uh, one is from Toro. Toro LFC you guys very excited about Gio Reyna as a prospect for the US men's national team. Seen him a bit at Dortmund, but would be interested in hearing Chris's opinion and outlook of him and how he could help the national team. Maybe some strengths and weaknesses, etc. Yeah, so Gio Reyna is a superb player. Obviously, Dortmund are pretty good at spotting talent. Um, and the Bundesliga is very open to taking um, US men's national team players. In fact, um, a colleague of mine spoke with Christian Seifert, CEO of, uh, of the DFL, the company that run um, Bundesliga 1 and Bundesliga 2. Uh, and they want to be home for some of the US men's national team talent because obviously it brings in that extra viewership. Um, but yeah, he's a superb player. I think we'll see him get more game time at Dortmund this season. Um, he sort of got dribs and drabs last season and scored a superb goal in a DFB Pokal against Werder Bremen. Um, look that up on YouTube if you've not seen it. Super, superb goal. Um, yeah, I mean, his, strength, his, his strengths are um, his strengths and his weaknesses is his age. Um, I think because he is so young, he's got absolutely no fear, but then he's still got quite a bit to learn. So I think we have to temper that. I, I want to bring it back round to Liverpool where Curtis Jones is, you know, he's got no fear. And that is and that is a strength, but sometimes it can be a weakness positionally, and that's he'll learn that, um, and and Gio Reyna will will learn that as well. But I mean, weaknesses, I wouldn't really like to to pick out any weaknesses as such because he's still a you know developing player. Um, I'll put my coach's hat on that. You know, a, a player at 18, 19 years of age is nowhere near the player he is at twenty six, so he's got plenty of development time coming still. Um, but I would like to see him get more game time and more development time. But he couldn't be a better club. Um, and can he help the U.S. men's national team? Hopefully he can. Um, but then don't put loads of pressure on him. That will be my other one. Yeah, some players take time. And you see a certain American player now at Chelsea just really flourishing because they, they were so, given the time. Yeah, a lot of pressure put on him at the time. He was the next big thing. He's playing, you know, he was the poster boy of the U.S. men's national team. And that probably came when he was in his, still in his development stage. And, you know, he unfortunately hit a bit of a, a dip in his development at the same time that um, Thomas Tuchel left. They brought in um, Peter Bosch, who didn't fit particularly well once his system was worked out. And Peter Stoger came in and, and that sort of combined with Pulisic's dip in form and everybody said he was written off and he was useless. And you know, he's gone to Chelsea and proven that that's not the case. And yeah, the, the young players will be I've got a roller coaster of form and some days they'll be great and some days they'll stink. Look at Trent Alexander Arnold. If you think back to that game he had against Manchester United, he was he was awful. Um, but that was part of his development. You know, he's not he's not one of the best right backs in the world now because of, of of the mistakes he's made has helped him become that, you know, one of the best right backs in the world. Players need to make mistakes to learn. So yeah, don't heap too much pressure on him and, and let him have the development time to play would be my advice. Nice. And last fan question from a certain Mr. Sam Maguire. <laughs> big, yes. big fan of yours, I believe. Um, he, asked, we, this, yeah. <laughs> he asked, and I've got no idea what this means. Do you regret not going to Sega's wedding? Please give hmm. us some context. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I think everybody knows Sega, great journalist, um, Ghanaian journalist. Um, so yeah, Sega was uh, covering Naby Keita at Leipzig at the same time I was covering Naby Keita at Leipzig. And obviously there was the move to Liverpool and you know, Sega's very, very well connected Ghanaian football journalist and um, you know, he had plenty of contact time with Naby Keita. So um, but Sega and I and Sam as well started to chat quite a lot, not just about football, about life in general. And believe it or not, um, Sega invited both Sam and I to his wedding. Wow. Um, but off the top of my head, it was either Christmas Day or Boxing Day. Um, it's about two years ago now. And obviously I, I couldn't travel Christmas Day or Boxing Day. You know, I've got like you've got family, I've got children. And, you know, uh, Christmas is a time um, for being with family. And it was just unfortunate that neither of us could travel over. So yes, I do um, regret not being able to go to his wedding, but I did actually bump into him. He was at the Parc de France for Liverpool's game against PSG. 
So um, I, I finally got to meet him and, yes, yeah, sit down and have a chat with him. And he's, he's a really nice guy. In fact, I think he spoke to Jurgen Klopp pretty much. Um, and Klopp was very interested in Guinea, the team, you know, in Guinea, the team, um, and chatted with him at great length. There's another insight into, you know, how personable Jurgen Klopp is. He took time out to speak to, to someone about their own national side. So it was really nice to meet him. Um, and of course, I spoke to him just before we came on because he is very well connected. And um, he also knows that Thiago would really like to come to Liverpool. And I know some people have said, in fact, I think I checked your Twitter before it came on. Someone asked you, how does he know that he's, a, he's an African journalist? Well, you know, there's a lot of African players, not just in, in the Premier League, but in the Bundesliga and in La Liga. Um, and when you're like the like the English journalists that cover the Bundesliga and the English players, we're, we're quite a close-knit um, family, if you want to call it. We all know each other. And that's the same for the Ghanaian journalists that work in Europe. They know all the Ghanaian players. Um, so their sources are pretty much spot on. I, I would not say... Um, how Sega knows this, I would not say that publicly, but um, let me just say that if he says that Thiago is interested in coming to Liverpool, he's got it from a very, very good source that people should probably take quite seriously. Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, for those who don't know what Sega wrote, I've got it up in front of me and I'm using um, Google's French translation here, so, so pardon for the weirdness. He goes, Thiago will be a player for Liverpool next season. I don't know if he means this season, but next season. Certainly it is not complete. Some details to be finalised. The preferred player to go to the champion of England. His confidences, or confidants maybe, were collected in selection. I don't know what that means. But <laughs> but the main, the first line is he will be a Liverpool player, which let's see. Sega comes through with the goods again. Could be very, yeah, very so, interesting. So Sega's spoken to um, a player who knows Thiago very well. Right. Um, as, as much as I can say makes sense well very very interesting let's see what happens uh let's see how i mean liverpool did remove their pin tweet that's usually the sign for us random twitter fans <laughs> we'll see if it goes long um now there's only i mean we've i've had you for like an hour now mate i don't know if you realize but it, it's gone it's gone beautifully it must be close to midnight there Oop, stuff's falling over on my deck uh yeah is there anything you'd like to say anything you'd like to push any any thoughts or predictions for the season ahead anything you want to put it forward um, I've got nothing to push at the minute because like many football writers, especially freelancers, um, you know, COVID-19 has been a bit of a, a, a kick in the nuts, can we say? I mean, I'm, what I could say, if anyone wants to hire me, feel free to do that. But um, <laughs> no, it, it, just in aside, um, yeah, I, I don't, literally don't have anything to push. Predictions for the season. Yeah, it's always a nightmare because, I mean, I, I don't know you, I don't, I wouldn't like to say Liverpool are going to win the league because... I don't want to. I don't want to think that now because you know it would break my heart if they didn't. But I would like to think that come May, um, come you know come the back end of um, you know come the back end and start of May that we'll be in the hunt for a Premier League title again. If we're not, I think I would be bitterly disappointed if we tailed off um, somewhat. Um, so yeah, I, I just hope that Liverpool go well. I'd really like to see them. Um, take all four competitions seriously. I know that might be sometimes a, a step too far, but we've won the league. That was everyone wanted the league. It's, you know, I think I was 11 last time they won the league and 40, you know, just turned 42. So mm. that that's that's off my back now. I've seen that. I've been lucky enough to see them win a Champions League twice in recent years, seen them win the Europa League or the UEFA Cup as it was. Um, I think I was in Cardiff for the... Was it Cardiff? No, it was Wembley for the game against Cardiff for the League Cup. I saw that, um, and I was in the I was in the game for the game against Chelsea, the FA Cup final. So I'd like to see us win um, another cup because I think cup final day outs at Wembley are pretty special, and uh, hopefully by then the fans will be back in, um, and and yeah, it'd be a great day out for everybody. But I'd, yeah, I'd like to see us win a couple of cups as well as the league, as well as the Champions League. So pretty much, I'd like to see us win everything. But I'm not going to say it out loud. That's yeah, it's it's tough. It's <laughs> all of us, everyone, the entire Liverpool world wants us to win it, and I think everyone's going to be disappointed if we don't. Of course, you should be disappointed that we don't. We do want it to be our bread and butter, but I think our big our biggest biggest disappointment would be if we don't take any trophy home next season. Um, I'm going to aim as high as possible. Same as you, we should be in for all four. Uh, I love us going super you know, all the way to the end of each final and even competing in the final. 
I'm remembering all of those things you're talking about the Alaves game the the Michael Owen FA Cup final the Champions League Istanbul all that, all those games that just came flooding back when you said like League Cup against Cardiff uh, that was Kenny's last title and stuff like that when he was managing for us so everything's just like these memories stay with you forever I don't care I was eight years old when we won the league and I was living in England back then still at the time never knew what would happen in the 90s onwards but we skipped country in 95 <laughs> so we got out of there uh, but mate it's uh let's hope COVID goes goes away as quickly as possible. Hopefully the vaccine's done. Hopefully we have fans back in stadiums ASAP. Hopefully you're you, I know you guys, especially sports journalism, is gonna be so rich once it comes back because everyone's going to want to have a piece of it. So I hope you and the family stay safe. I hope the freelancing goes well, especially because people need people who are watching like us Australians on the TV. <laughs> they can't go to game. Yeah, the Bundesliga is a, a little, um, not a little better, but they're a, they're a little more forward in their protocols. So um, access to the press box will be easier in Germany um, than it will be in the UK. So um, yeah, that's uh, one positive I've got to look forward to with uh, that league coming back on the 16th. Fantastic. And just a, a little plug before we uh, before we wrap up, uh, for those who don't know and you're listening to the podcast for the first time, those in New South Wales, we are running a major Liverpool kit event uh, with Ultra Football in New South Wales. It's being run as well and sponsored by many people. I'll call them out now if I can remember them quickly. Liverpool New South Wales are helping us run the event, which is fantastic. There is Colour Effects Painting Group. There's Consanthus uh, Financial Advisors. There is, I've uh, forgotten the other one. Oh my God, I can't believe it's sticking out of my head. Um, obviously, the major sponsor is Claymore Wines, who are doing a whole lot with us. i got to remember the last one, otherwise I'm going to absolutely kick myself. Oh, I can't get it in my head. Oh yes, Pharmacy Mart in Fairfield. <laughs> so we got a whole bunch of guests coming down. Daniel Garb, Lucy Zelich, uh, Michelle Escobar, uh, Matt Yerman, Corey Gamero, all these people that Australians would know about. So please head down if you can to Ultra Football. It's going to be completely COVID safe. If you cannot, we're running competitions on this couch to give away seven or eight kits. I think it's seven kits. Vapor, Nike Vapor kits. We're giving them away for free. Find out how to do it by looking at our page. And we're giving away eight $50 uh, vouchers for ultra football that you can go and spend watch us follow our pages facebook instagram uh, twitter to work out how so that's my little plug thank you chris it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you finally face to face and to hear your thoughts on liverpool the game transfers and all the above thanks very much and i'm also looking forward to seeing you on my television just before liverpool play leeds i believe is that true if i make the cut <laughs> So we never know. I was told, okay, so this is what you do. You sit down, have a talk, answer a few questions about Liverpool and the title win, being an Australian Liverpool fan. They even asked about my podcast. I'm like, how, how do you know about my podcast? <laughs> I'm guessing that's how, how I got picked. And then from there with the videoing and doing some B-roll, they said, okay, well, now we're going to send it to a UK producer who's then going to put it all together and they will pick the people. Because I think there's five or six Liverpool fans in Australia got picked. So if I make the cut, I, you could see this ugly mug worldwide, which is very scary. <laughs> <laughs> be That'll be spot. good. Oh. Well deserved. I hope you get it. Oh, well, I. It's not my career, you know. This is just me talking about the club I love. My, I love my day job as well. <laughs> so I'm actually kind of worried that my day job are going to go. Are you going to leave us? <laughs> What's going? Because I don't tell anyone about this side of my world. I I keep them very separated. So, this is just my hobby. Uh, so, but. Yeah, let's see. I apologize in advance. It could be very cringy. <laughs> so, hope I don't say anything stupid or said anything stupid because it's quite a pressure situation. Uh, okay, Chris, thank you so much. Have a wonderful night. Sleep well. You deserve it. And uh, hopefully we chat again very soon. Cheers. Thanks a lot. Thanks, mate. All right. Speak to you later. Everyone who's listening, hope you enjoyed the podcast. Please share. Please tell your friends about it. And if you want to come on the couch, let me know. Have a very good day or night and goodbye.